Hi, everyone. I'm here with Matthew Chamonix. Thank you so much, Matthew, for joining us here with Metal Aid. Um, Matthew is a jeweler, a silversmith, an instructor, and an author, and one half of the Toolbox Initiative, which was started in 2014 with Tim McCray. Thank you so much, Matthew. It's a pleasure to meet you. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Okay, well, you're a very busy person, so I'm what? extra grateful. Not only are you currently preparing for a solo exhibition at LA Pie Gallery, you also just launched your third book, In Adam, on June 9th. Congratulations. And you're all working on a fourth book. Um, these are huge undertakings, including travel and immer immersion into indigenous communities of the Sahara. And you're also a busy working artist. Uh, so what propels you to take on these massive projects involving these epic journeys? Um, well, the, 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 the book, I just, uh, I'm just passionate about um, discovering new technique or ancestral technique and, and, and uh, learning them and sharing them pretty much. But most of all, I think it's, um, I like the idea of conserving the technique. Um, some of them, mostly in West Africa, they have tendency to, to disappear. And um, so I'm trying to really uh, get them in a book. So for the future generation, mostly future generation of, of Inadon, like of the Tuareg, um, you know, we we I seen with the pandemic even uh, a lot of my jeweler friend in in those part of the world that they um they didn't have work, so they started switching and doing something totally different. A lot of them went gold mining, and so sometimes they don't come back to to their original uh, work. So you lose uh, technique. So the idea is really to uh, to keep those techniques alive. Right, I think there was a a beautiful quote. I'm looking in the legacy copy of Legacy I have, and it says, "Well, I won't show it to the camera. I don't think it'll show up." But the, you start your introduction by saying, "In Africa, when an elder dies, it's like a library burning." Yeah, totally. That's uh, that's a quote from uh, Amadou Ampateba, a great writer, and uh, it's it's so true. It's for every aspect, because um, there is not, there is only sharing. Uh, let's say for a jeweler, you know, usually you share with an uncle, or with a nephew or a son, and but if you don't have a son or a nephew, all your technique dies with you. So it's uh, that's where it comes from, really. Yeah. Mm. Um, and is it mostly just men who who practice? jewelry metalsmithing still, it's still mostly men in west africa there is few places where um where, where women are jewelers like in togo uh, you can find quite a lot of uh, women jewelers in senegal more and more in nigeria so there is places where it's happening more and and i think it will it just you know uh, time is catching so it will it, it's there is no resistance it's just mm. how the culture is um, moving along slowly mm. and, um, but in uh, in Adon culture the the women in Adon uh, they are called teen Adon they are um, they, they're considered jeweler but they work leather oh interesting yeah but they're they're considered in the same as the 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 other artisans so but uh, but they do work leather and the man works the metal oh, okay that's interesting well hopefully it'd be great to see like um the the techniques being taught across the board you know that's something i've learned learning uh interviewing masters that i've been fortunate to speak to like yourself um the idea that if somebody knows the information i know it only makes the discipline stronger, right? So yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Hopefully, more people share every all of their knowledge, um, yeah. as we undergo this massive change to digital, the digital world. Um, but thank you. That leads me to my next question. Um, you you visited 
dozens of African countries um, in West and Northern Africa for your three publications. Is there a certain criteria that determines the countries you visit or routes you take throughout the continent? Like what, what are you following? Um, I'm following the jewelers. Um, so often I will go to a country where there is uh, a, a, a quite a big culture on jewelry making. Um, so I started in 96, I lived in Mali for three years, uh, Mali, West Africa, which is very rich in, in jewelry making, in, in, in any in culture in general, but in jewelry making. And there is different, um, different um, culture inside uh, the country. So there is the Tuareg, the Fulani, the Bambaha. So you can, you, you find a lot of jewelers. So Mali was, uh, at the time I thought, really unbelievable. So that was one country. Then uh, Senegal is very rich in, in jewelry making as well, filigree. And, and so I spend a lot of time in Senegal, in Niger, because the Tuareg are uh, in the north of Niger and um and very rich in in artisans so there is but there is other country where it's less so i try it look for jeweler and if it doesn't if we i don't find a lot of jeweler or you know uh, I, i'm going to take an example uh, in benin i went a few times but it's very hard to find jewelers you have to travel a lot between each jewelers in Senegal, you go to any neighborhood and you find 10 jewelers. So it, I, I'm really following the, the, the jewelers. So I, I have a tendency to go to country where there is a lot of jewelry making. So Senegal, Mali, Niger, uh, Togo, Guinea. So those are really the, the country. Ghana, there is a lot of uh, bronze, a little bit less jewelry per se but a lot of bronze casting. So it's very interesting in Burkina Faso, same thing, a lot of bronze, but less jeweler. And often those country where there is not too many jewelers, you find Tuareg or Senegalese jeweler. Uh, so, but often I like to go straight to the source where, where. And so that's why I spend time in country where it's very rich um, in jewelry making. And I read in, in your book that um, sometimes you can follow the sounds of the hammers or the files, the hand tools to find the jewelers. Yeah, mostly when I started uh, going to West Africa, I, I will just walk the street. So I, I'll be just spent, sometimes I spend all day just walking around and discovering new neighborhood. And, and that's, you know, you could hear the hammer somebody forging a ring or a bracelet and then you follow the sound of the hammer and find a jeweler so that's off and, and then when you find one jeweler um there's such uh um they're so generous and friendly that one jeweler will lead you to all their friends very fast and you're always welcome anywhere as a jeweler you're almost part of a family so it's very Easy. As soon as you find one, it just it's a spider web. So it's 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 fantastic. I love that part. That's great. And I've I read that also you've you've met people um repeatedly through your your work and your travels as well. Oh yeah, I can uh, and more and more. I mean, I, I I meet someone and I know his cousin from somewhere else and his uncle and so. It, it like I say, it's a big family, so we all it's all connected somehow. And when I was doing Inadon, uh, one of the main person that worked a lot on the book, uh, Mohammed Ajida Hada, is is unbelievable. He took so many of the pictures during the pandemic. Um, that's how the book came about. Is is um, I hired few jeweler and sent them smartphone, and they took the picture and. So uh, it, it really it's done by the Tuareg on the Tuareg, which was great. But him, I met him through his cousin, Lamine, that I met in Burkina Faso 10 years ago, or 15, yeah, maybe even 12 years ago. And then I was 
telling Lamine about my project and he said, my cousin takes great pictures. So, and now uh, Mohammed is one of my dearest friend and uh, uh, is, is really great. And, and through Mohammed all, also we, then I reconnected with Lamine and we opened with a toolbox, we opened three schools for girls through Lamin in Niger. And so it, it's, you know, it's a circle. It's really fantastic. That's incredible. Yeah. That's okay. Legacy has been described as being part technical guide and part anthropological study. Is this the intention you had for the project when it comes to sharing with Western and especially North American audiences? I, I did. Um, and again, I, the, 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 I think what I wanted to do is really to, to preserve the techniques in the book. But at the same time, I wanted to, and it's the same for Inadon, I wanted to show how um, people work and the process of it to really um, go deeper into the, the, you know, we see a piece of jewelry, but we don't know how it's made. And sometimes there is so many beautiful steps and <clears throat> creating a special tools for it. So I wanted to share that. And in Adon, it's even more step-by-step -step process of uh, over 40 different pieces uh, from the Tuareg culture. So <clears throat> it, is, um, it, it is what you said, it's both. It's, and to me, it's very important that it, it is both. Um, and when I share a technique, when I when I show how it's made, the, the I don't want people to doing to redo it. Mm -hmm. they, they're welcome to redo it as a personal training thing, but you know it's a culture thing. So to me, it's very important that it stays um, um, cultural and not just for everyone to do it. But to to you know when you make a piece like like there is in a book. Um, you can practice by making the same, but then it brings you so much more uh, as you learn the technique. So then you create your own from that technique. That's the idea behind it, I think, yeah. Hmm. And that's actually something I wanted to ask you if you were worried about the appropriation of some of these forms and objects. Um, I'm an educator as well, and I know that's you know something we have to protect um, information, we have to protect information be, from becoming usurped in that way. So yeah. is, there, is there anything, uh, have you encountered problems in that regard or is there anything that you've done to protect the knowledge in that way? I never did. I, I, I think uh, I, you know, I have faith in people that they, they know what to do, what's right in a way, and I, I put it in in Adon, I said really those pieces are, are part of the Tuareg culture and it's a Tuareg uh, piece of jewelry or, or um, and, and the book is really made to discover how it was made, not for people to copy the, the, the piece, but I have no control of course. Um, that being said, I think the Tuareg um, jewelry by example, is so famous. Um, most of people seen a piece of Tuareg jewelry. So if anybody will copy it, it will be so obvious that I think they will shoot themselves uh, in the foot in a way. Um, and, and I give classes with West African technique, or could be filigree or other thing, but each time at each classes, I said, you know, this is the technique to go to create something this way, but you, you need to find your own way after in design, not, not you know, uh, the design I find is really, um, yeah, it's part of the culture. So I'm always worried about it uh, to some extent, I, I think, um, but I, I, yeah, I have trust in people that people sh know what's right in a way and, and it's explained in a book. So yeah, um, it's a hard one because yes, I, I do worry sometimes. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you also are adamant about not just showing the work, but also the artists who create the work and, and your relationship with that artist. You know, you're very um, 
you're adamant about making sure that the that that maker is known yeah i think uh, the technique without the maker that doesn't mean much to me i like to uh, to give what's you know uh, the person who show me something I, I want him to to have the recognition of what he showed and and i think his life and his um how he got to make jewelry or how he is as important as the technique so yes i i um i feel like and, and throughout the three books um there is biography and 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 talking about the the person that makes it i think it's for me, it's it's really important. Yes. Yeah. Well, that you can see that throughout the book of uh, the legacy, and um, um... and it's the same thing for the book on stamping. Uh, when I was doing that book, it's um, it's a little bit different because stamping I learned it when I lived in New Mexico. So it's um, when I was young, it's the first technique I learned. And it's it's really used by Navajo, and of course it's a technique used all over the world. But I learned it with Navajo, and as I was young, because I learned it there, of course I was doing Southwest style pieces. So, you know, and um, but when I moved to Canada, I I slowly I moved away from that and created my own stamping technique. Uh, but I, uh, you know, everything I learned, I owe it really to, uh, to driller in New Mexico or in Africa, because in Africa they do stamping. So, you know, I, I want to give back and that's what I try to do in a book. I want to really give back to the people who are showing me things. Right. Well, that, well, that's interesting because you just talked a little bit about your, your growth from. And from your as being an artist from when you started to where you are now as an author, like the way you the way you present this information to the Western audience has has the way the way you deliver that information changed over time in the past. I think it's almost 10 years since you published your first book. Um, have you changed you know, any of your philosophy about how to deliver this information? No, I think it's still the same. Uh, I, I think I will go actually more and even deeper into uh, in, into the ownership of the techniques and the 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 life of the people. Yeah, I think it's it, it's more and more. Um, I, I like to, you know, Inadon. Let's say Inadon. It's a it's a great example. I, I my name is on the cover. I wrote the book, but I didn't write. I mean, I wrote all the text, but I, um, it's it's really uh, hundreds of people together that made that book. I don't feel like it's my book. I feel it's really uh, the book of the artisans in it. But of course, I could not put 50 names on the cover. I tried to put few, but it didn't. Uh, the publisher, it was not working. Uh, so I put it in the first page to explaining really and... Um, but it's to me, it's really uh, made by the Tuareg artisans, which is that's why I think it's this rich. Uh, I could never have done something like that without um, Mohammed, uh, Bamba, all the people who took the picture. And uh, by example, Mohammed Ajida, I talked to you about earlier, he right away he understood the whole project. And so he introduced me to uh, older jeweler that um, really are into the culture, um, meaning, you know, every picture he took, the people they had their turban on, they, they were dressed as Tuareg. He, he really went um, all the way and and um, and wanted to share his culture as well as the technique. So everything is really thought. When, whenever I did a, a a photo shoot with someone, and sometimes it could spend two weeks for one project because he was taking the picture, sending the picture, and the step by step. Um, but 
he always makes sure everything around is it look uh, it's cultural and it's uh, the person is dressed as it should be dressed. Uh, it was really amazing. Yeah, that's sort of the way I've you know when looking at these images, it it is very intimate in a way, and I feel very privileged to have these glimpses into these workshops. And um, yeah, it's, it's very valuable information that you've collected. Um, and I do recommend, I think every jeweler would be fascinated to see the different bench setups and the, the way the tools are, they not only, many of the makers not only make jewelry, but they make the tools that they make the jewelry with. Um, and that's just fascinating. Yeah. And it's amazing how good the, those tools are. Um, <laughs> I, I use, you know, as hammer, I use Touareg hammer that friend made me because they're, I mean, they are the best hammer you can get, I think. Um, so, so you, you gained access to the communities via the jewelers. Were, were there, I suppose there were, you know, government, there must have been some, some hoops you had to go through governmentally speaking or through your publisher are there any other connections that you had to develop to to establish these connections and and no i i really not even government um uh, no? no it's um just by i mean literally by walking the street and 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 by connecting with you know one that introduced me to few more and and it goes so fast um how many people you meet each trip i can meet a hundred different artists and uh, and then keep contact through the years and then they introduce me to others so it, it really it, it it's a it's a huge um uh, it's a huge connection um i don't know how to uh, ex express it it's um it's quite fantastic i have to say it's it and but it's so easy to meet people and 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 uh, and befriend people in West Africa, I find uh, much more than here. And also the generosity you can walk, you know, you cannot walk in a walk, workshop here and, and watch people working. They'll be like, okay, you know. <laughs> but, Harbor Front um, Center, you can. <laughs> yeah, in West Africa, you you walk into any workshop and, and, and you know, introduce yourselves, start talking and they might give you a hammer and a piece of silver and ask you to do something to prove that you you know what you're doing. That happened many times, but but then it's like as as when they know you're a jeweler and you know how to work with your hand, that's it. You're in. So it's uh, it's fantastic. So it just it just uh, walking the street, connecting with people. Is there? I wonder if there's any opportunity maybe for an exchange for some of those artists to come here or is that something that you may consider doing in the future i'm trying to it's what's very hard is the visa mm -hmm. uh, they don't give too many too many visa i did a letter on the invitation and uh to a friend to many friends but one of them got a visa so it might come in september and then i'll organize workshop for him to show his techniques oh wow uh, we're working on it, but it, yeah, I, I wish I could bring many friends to to come and teach here. But um, it's the visa; it's really hard to get a visa to come here. Imagine. Uh, so I bring people there. So oh. uh, with the toolbox, we created also the toolbox travel, and we used to bring six, seven people to West Africa to work with the jewelers. And I'm gonna we're gonna develop that even more, like create a workshop and and really do workshops in West Africa. Great, and that was I I was wondering how how um integral the toolbox initiative has been in in your exchanges. Um, did I hear you correctly when you said you were opening schools for girls? Yeah, but the toolbox um, originally was to just bring tools. Yeah. So we get tools from jewelers in North America or money. We buy tools. We bring that to West Africa. Uh, then the pandemic uh, came along and most of every jeweler didn't have 
work. So we concentrate by sending money. So we sent money all over West Africa a few times to help out during the pandemic. And then when it slowed down a little bit, um, and we got that offer from uh, Lamin to, he wanted to open a school for girls because in his village, the girls were not getting any education. So we we started in his village and then we opened a second one in another village and a third one. So now he, he, he has three schools, probably around 60 to 70 girls. But it's a, a not jewelry school, it's really a, uh, educate like mathematics and, and French and uh, uh, writing and reading. So those are fantastic. Then we open also a jewelry school for young boys in that part during the pandemic. And in the next few weeks, we're opening a leather school. Oh, for that's girls. incredible. Congratulations. So, yeah, it's fun. We, we, we're trying to, I, I think education is probably the most important. Uh, so we're, we're switching slowly to more of education and, uh, and it's, I, I, I love it. I think it's really, um, the best way to go. A tremendous impact. And this is, um, this is still with Tim McCrate, this initiative. Yes. Yes, it is in, uh, when I wrote legacy, I met Tim and, uh, he always wanted to go to Africa, so I said, "Listen, for the for the last chapter, I need to go to Senegal, and would you come with me?" And right away, he said yes. So we went to Senegal, and uh, I told him, "I said when I go, I bring a little bit of tools, silver to give to friends." So he, he brought tools and silver, and when we were there, he was like, "We should do that in a bigger thing," and so that's when the toolbox was born, and and because of his. Um, you know, he's way more together than I am in like the business part of it. And, and also he's, he's so famous in the States and in Canada with all his books that it became, you know, what it is today because of him. So it's, it's fantastic to, to be able to, to do that with him. And he's, he's such a wonderful man that it's, uh, yeah, it's perfect. And is there a specific tool that you might suggest has had the most impact? I think the most impact, of course, is will be a, a droplet is always what people love to get, a brand oh. new droplet. Um, I mean, you know, uh, I have some here. This is droplet you can find easily in West Africa. Oh, wow. So it's a piece of steel, it's handmade, and it, just the hole is made with a nail, and it still has the, a little bit of a cone, but all the mark you can see is because it's hammered to close down the hole if need be. Um, so okay. droplets. Yes. Hmm? Oh, I just, I had to understand for a second, but yeah, I get it. Yeah, so droplet is, is always like on top of the list, then it's files. Uh, good files. Um, you know, we're, we're lucky enough to have those beautiful files from Switzerland or Germany that actually file. Um, often over there, you can find uh, very cheap file probably made in China, but they're not even hardened steel. It's uh, what we call, uh, um, what's it called? I forgot the term. When you are the... Um, Arden, only the outer part of the car of the steel. Um, there's a term, but I, I have a blank. It's um, case hardening. Oh. And case hardening is you add you add just a, a carbon powder on the outside, so it's hard on the outside, but it's soft on the inside. So they don't last at all. And uh, so files, needle files, and files and droplets. I think those are the. Uh, best thing to, to 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 be able to bring okay i mean the yeah. droplet is so beautiful but it would save a lot of work if they could just have the one from grow bay <laughs> i know and and i mean to me it's like i i i think i have a collection of probably like 30 of those i love the old one they're amazing yeah yeah so uh 
but it goes much faster with a nice uh, yes. brand new droplet. Yes. Yeah. I have this tool show and tell. I'm not sure if you can see that. Oh, beautiful. That's Touareg. Is it? Okay. I wanted to see. My, my husband was in Mali and he brought this back for me. Yeah, it's so funny because it's... Uh, um, uh, yeah, it's Touareg from Mali, and it's uh, it's one of the first thing I was making. Oh, really? Yeah, because I, I was in a Touareg camp in uh, around Bamako, and they were making kitchen. I mean, not bottle opener, but kitchen, same where you encrusted the the metal inside, and it's a fantastic technique to to put that metal inside it. You want to tell us about it? Yeah, it's in it's in legacy. You'll see it, but it's uh what so what you do is you you have the wood, you make the metal form, mm -hmm. those uh, little um, twist thing, and uh, like on the on the in the wood, mm -hmm. and so what you do is you you glue those form on top of the wood with super glue. Then you take a pair of pliers, you heat up one of the two jaws. And when it's hot red, you put it on the metal and you push down and the, the old metal just go right in. Oh. And so that's how it's done. Yeah. Oh, great. So an inlay technique, special inlay. Yeah, yeah. It's a fantastic technique. Yeah. I, I mean, my husband just hand me this and I, I mean, there's so much work in this. There's copper, there's brass, there's this steel is probably that... Um, encasement steel or whatever however yeah, just... they, they usually any steel laying around they're going to recycle it and and shape it yeah and cut it and, and you, you can see the engraving on the on the brass yeah. done with a little screwdriver so it's really beautiful Driver. wow yeah i love this i it's no ordinary bottle opener that's for sure that's it yeah <laughs> okay um so if we can speak about your work, your personal artwork, you make, I used to work at LA Pie Gallery. So I'm familiar with your, your beautiful rings and bracelets um, and they're very luxurious and beautiful. Thank you. So has your, has your experience or understanding of luxury as it relates to jewelry metal smithing, has it changed since your travels? It, yes, it's always changing. Um, and it's funny, more and more than I, 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 I'm going there, I think um, it's a tricky question. <laughs> um, I love working with simple technique, but adding uh, gold and diamond just to, to bring that technique to a different level to some extent. And I think being around Tim McRae as well is changing my view of things because his approach to jewelry making is it's really interesting. So to him, it's to make a mark on the metal. So by example, he's going to forge a piece and leave all the hammer mark mm. because to him, that's the value of, of the maker. And it's almost like fingerprint on the server. And so I think since I've been around him, this is playing a lot in me. And I do like also to finish things perfectly. So it, it, I'm, I'm always like in between, I want to leave those marks and I want to finish. So yeah, it's, it's, it's constantly uh, moving. The, but lately I, I, I don't make a lot of pieces. Um, I would say for the last, Three years I've not been making so many because I worked on Inadon and now on the new chain book. So it's, 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 mm. yeah. Well, that's not surprising with how much yeah. you're going on. Uh, but please continue to make because your work is incredible. Oh, thank you. And I, I would agree, you know, somebody who didn't, didn't know about stamping or much about metal work would not ever think that a person had done that by hand, your, your stamping work. It's oh, just so you. pristine. Um, so I'm interested to see those little marks of the hand show up and how they will show up. 
Yeah, that's it. And maybe it will one day. <laughs> um, so if you could tell us, this is my last question, but I think we'd all love to know about your chain book, your next publication, and what you will be showing at LA Pi Gallery. Uh, so the chain book, I'm going to start with the chain book. It's a, uh, it's a book. Uh, again, it's something Tim McRae wanted to do for the last thirty years. He always wanted to have a chain book that represent. Um, so we've been talking about it for a long time, and during the pandemic, I started a little bit. Then I decided I wanted to do something on trike, so I totally put it aside. Uh, but now I've been at it nonstop, and it's a uh, it's a book about. Um, and again, it's to conserve techniques. So it's a book about, I'm going to try to do between 50 and 100 chains. So every chains we find that are machine made, I want to, it's going to be a step-by-step -step process of, of how it's made. Um, so that's, that, that takes a lot of time because I need to reinverse engineering uh, some of the chain um, that nobody knows how they were made. Sometimes I sent picture to friend in West Africa, mostly in Togo, because they know Chen very well. And in 24 hours, if I send a picture, they'll, they'll send me a movie how it's made. They'll make it. So it's quite fantastic. But but uh, yeah, so the idea, I, I have a simple chapter. I can show you a couple, uh, a page. It's really, um, um, you know, like every step of how a chain is made. Here we don't see uh, many, but it starts, you know, uh, making the mandrel, and this one is the uh, palm chain. So it's, it's, and it's like, uh, you know, those beautiful. Oh, that's gorgeous. Perfect. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it's really the step by step. And, uh, and it's going to be, a big book because there is a lot of image and a lot and and I think and we also doing a book for the first time we're gonna have a it's not a code bar it's a those square new um you know like for the during the pandemic when you get your your vaccine you have a oh the QR code can, yeah QR code thank you so for the first time it's gonna be a book with a QR code that brings you to a video of the, the ch making the chain as well. Multimedia. Yeah, so it's it's quite fun. Uh, it's going to be a, a fun project. So that was the first question. The the other one for the for at Pi, what I really want to do is a a, um, a book on signet ring. So I'm going to try to make uh, a lot of different kind of ring. Um, trying to include stamping into it. So some are simple as a, a, a box ring, I we call, but with stamping. I don't know if I have an example of what I, I was working on. Are these, these hollow? hollow? Mm -hmm. Are they hollow or? Some are hollow, like, uh, so I, I can make a, a, a the form like that, but it's stamped on the, on the side and it's totally hollow inside. Great. Some will have like inlay of stone or other things. So I'm, I'm, you know, playing around still. But uh, the idea is to make. Yeah, I'm hoping to have at least forty different signet ring, but going from every direction. So some will be forged, and forged, and so yeah, that's the idea. I can't wait. And you're, are you kind of looking at the the cultural significance of the signet ring? or the history at all? Is that part of like, why the signet? Is there a specific reason? Well, the signet um, in French, it's, I think we understand it more because it's called in Chevalier. And Chevalier is from uh, Chevalier, which is, uh, uh, what is it in English, Chevalier? Uh, anyway, uh, in, in the old time of the kings, uh, people oh, totally. ring. Yeah, people wear a ring with with the the family crest on it. Oh, heraldry. Yeah, and so those are chevalier family crest, and and the the shape is similar, and they could just 
put the crest on wax or on um on to to close a letter or something. So the origin of those to me it's it's that direction. But why I really wanted to do it is in West Africa every ring is is um is forged as a signet ring, but um, with different shape, like uh, you know, like this ring. It's it's the beginning of one, but it's forged from an ingot just with a hammer to shape it. Oh, beautiful! Oh, so love. that that's what I learned in, in to to make rings in West Africa is to just with a hammer. So I'm trying to really go from a simple forged shape into something you know, more modern and maybe with like pavé of diamond and switch it around a little bit. So that's where I'm going. So basically everything you can draw out of that form, that sort of traditional form. Yeah, exactly. And also some, you know, I'm, I'm working on, instead of being a um, a family crest, um, I, I, I worked in Nepal for a while with jewelers there and I brought back a lot of... Uh, old old um stamp i mean it, they're not stamped they're actually mold uh in steel like that with a shape so what i want to do is instead of a crest is maybe put uh some of those shape like inside the ring and then you have the positive on the ring as well so anyway yeah I, I love that sort of tool slash adornment space i think that's really interesting place to yeah. be I think it's going to be, I'm hoping it's going to be, I still need to do a lot of them, but I'll work this summer and uh, I'll get there. Well, on that note, I shouldn't take up more of your time. You could probably make a ring here in uh, the space of this interview. So, <laughs> no. but I, I'm very grateful you paused your busy career to speak with us oh. briefly today. All good. Anytime. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. much. I, I can't wait to see the exhibition. Good. I hope it will. Uh, yeah. I, I, uh, yeah, I love that gallery. It's it, it's such a great place to uh, to show. It's, I've been oh. showing that for a long time now, and it's it's been great. It's a really important gallery. Yeah, it is. I I agree. Yeah. You gotta hold on to these <laughs> important galleries. Well, thank you very much. And um, I'll let you go enjoy your this hot, hot day in your beautiful shop. That's it. Thank you so much. Pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Bye-bye.